that type of viewpoint of this just one way directional, like I'm upset that everybody's been sinning against me and I need to take it out on somebody and oh, I'm gonna send my son into the world and take it out on him. It just doesn't make sense because it really goes against justice. What's up everybody, this is Josh from Practical Theism. I hope everybody's doing well. Happy Thursday, it's Holy Thursday. We're actually celebrating the Last Supper of Christ tonight before tomorrow, Good Friday, where all of this transpires that we've been discussing this week with the seven last sayings of Christ. We're going to jump in the fourth last saying today, which is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And this takes place in Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew. We're gonna jump over there, Matthew 27, verse 46, but we're gonna start in verse 40. Five and uh, just get a little bit of backstory here. Now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon all the land until the ninth hour. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of those who were standing there when they heard it began saying, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and taking a sponge, he filled it with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave him a, gave him a drink. But the rest of them said, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. So first thing to really note is this took place at the ninth hour, which would have been about three o'clock. This is important because at precisely three o'clock during the Passover feast, the lamb was presented by the high priest as the sacrificial offering and for the atonement of the sins of the people. It was, the lamb was sacrificed and the blood that came forth from the lamb brought redemption for the people. Anybody who's followed Jesus' ministry and you go back to all of the writings of Christ, he's very clearly identified as the lamb of God and the lamb that has come to be sacrificed for mankind. Jesus also, this Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's actually quoting Psalm 22. And I'm gonna read the Psalm here for you just so you can get a little bit of context with it. Psalm 22 says this, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish, my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night, but I do not find rest. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In, uh, in you, our ancestors put their trust, they trusted you and you delivered them to you. They cried out and were saved in you. They trusted and were not put to shame. Jesus is showing us really a couple of things here. First of all, his alignment with the Father's will. He's bearing witness to the Old Testament. And it's really interesting. He's sending a message to the Jews, I think, that even in the throes of death, we need to trust and we need to honor God. And that's all a part of the atonement that is going on and taking place right now. He, uh, he wants us to really know, and I think it's really important to not stop at the first two verses of that psalm and continue down, because even though there's this lamentation, this massive sorrow, and this, God, why have you forsaken me? I, I'm not seeing it. It's recapped in verses three to five in Psalm 22 by reaffirming who God is, and then also what that means for us and what we should do in response to that. We should put trust that God's gonna deliver, you are the one who saved them. You did not put them to shame when they trusted in you. And so I think he's sending a message to the Jews right now that even in the throes of death, he's bearing witness to the Old Testament or he's showing that they need to honor and they need to trust God with their salvation. And he's also stating um, a message, the message in Hebrew, the Eli Eli Laman Sabachthani in Hebrew. So as Chrysostom said, to be plain and intelligible to them, and by all things he shows that he is of one mind with him that begot him, end quote. So he said it in Hebrew because he wanted to make it painstakingly clear to all of the Jews who were present exactly where he was quoting and what he was talking about. Now, this is interesting. Some of the some Christians have a view of atonement that it was just God punishing an innocent man for the sins of the guilty, punishing this innocent man for something that he didn't do. This idea that God pours out his wrath to satiate this kind of angry snit so he can stop being angry somehow. And, you know, it just that type of viewpoint of this just one way directional, like I'm upset that everybody's been sinning against me and I need to take it out on somebody and oh, I'm gonna send my son into the world and take it out on him. 
It just doesn't make sense because it really goes against justice, first of all. We talk a lot about God being one who is just. He is just and his qualities, by the way, are immutable. They're not changeable. So his justice is, he's just all the time. He's not unjust one time and not another time. And it makes no sense because of his unchanging nature that uh, he, he doesn't have these divine emotional mood swings, so to speak. Like he's angry one day and then he gets his anger satiated and all of a sudden he's happy the next day. So I think we have to look at it through that lens because when you get into that type of thinking about how viewing the atonement, it gets you into murky water pretty quick because some have even gone on to say that God turned his back on Christ at this moment in full separation from Christ during his his crucifixion. And that just doesn't make sense because God and Jesus are one. God can't be divided. John 10, 30 says, I and the Father are one. So it's it's pretty clear that there's a un, there's a bound unity that's not separated or broken. How do we understand this, this idea here? I think the best way to look at this is we see Christ issuing a love offering to the Father. He went all the way down into our sin, our God forsakenness, and suffered with us freely to the point of death. And so you see that even in his lamentation, uh, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, why have you forsaken me? He's identifying with on the human aspect, because remember, God is human and divine. On the human side of things, he's really identifying with our lamentation that we cry out to God often. Lastly, I want to leave you with this, and it's actually a quote from a gentleman named Brian Cross, who's a a convert to the faith and just has some really, really keen insights into what's going on. He said this, Christ made atonement for the sins of all men by offering to God a sacrifice of love that was more pleasing to the Father than the combined sins of all men of all time are displeasing to him. Hence, through the cross, Christ merited the grace of salvation for all men. Those who refuse his grace do not do so because Christ did not die for them or did not win sufficient grace for them on the cross, but because of their own free choice. Remember, free will is never impinged upon, and that's part of God's mercy is justice because true love is always chosen. I hope this is helpful. Hope this uh, gives you something to think about during this uh, Holy Thursday as we celebrate the Last Supper. Definitely drop some comments below, some questions. Throw a like down on that like button. Pound that subscribe button like you mean it so you can get more of this awesome content. Hope everybody has a blessed Holy Thursday. And until next time, we'll talk to you then. Thanks.